<laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and get started here. Hello, inventors and entrepreneurs. My name is Courtney Laskowitz, and I am the Managing Director of Inventors Groups of America, and welcome to Inventors Online. If you're hearing me talk, you have made it in, so congratulations. I thank you everyone for coming for this very exciting meeting today. A little bit about IGA before we go ahead and get started. IGA was founded in 2017 by Stephen Key and Andrew Krauss, who are here with us today. Our goal is twofold. We want to teach individuals how to best commercialize their product ideas, as well as strengthen and support inventor groups throughout the nation. We have a directory of local and regional inventor groups on our website, and if you're located near one, we would highly encourage you to join. Just so you guys are all aware, our meeting is being recorded for internal purposes. Everyone here who has made it in is a mover and a shaker. Many inventors don't have the knowledge or tools to commercialize their products, whether it's by starting their own business or licensing. So we provide inventors with resources, information, access, and support. Our website offers a place for inventors to learn and share together. We hold monthly meetings for inventor group leaders, as well as hold public educational webinar series once a month where we bring on guest speakers. Now today is IGA's Inventors Online, which is the first virtual inventors group. Our goal is to educate through leadership and guidance from leading industry experts, empower you with trustworthy resources you need to succeed, and give you the experience you have been waiting for in the product commercialization world. Now, as we get started here, please open your chat boxes on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. We'd love to hear your name and what state or country you are from. Mm -hmm. You go ahead on over right now and you can type that into the chat box while we go ahead and get started here. Just be aware, please do not disclose anything that is confidential and is not already publicly available. Now, before we get into the presentation, a brief housekeeping so you guys are all aware, please make sure your participants in chat panel are open. Uh, please make sure your name is the name you signed up with. It's nice to get to know the community. So go ahead and you can feel free to rename yourself now. You can change that in the participants panel and please place your questions into the chat box. If you have a technical question, feel free to just message me directly. Uh, and finally, you can choose to be in speaker mode or in gallery mode at the top right hand corner of your screen. We <clears> encourage <throat> you to turn on your video, but it's not necessary, but we would love to see you. We've also placed the rules in the chat box up at the top as well. So now that that is all out of the way, we have our co-founders on, Stephen Key, who is also our guest speaker, and Andrew Kraus. Uh, before we let Stephen talk, uh, Andrew, before I introduce you. Wait, wait, who invited him to be the guest speaker? What's <laughs> going on with that? <laughs> before we I'm just kidding. Start He's here. great. You guys are going to love, you guys are going to love this tonight. Go ahead, Courtney. No, I just wanted to ask if you had anything to, to say or to mention about Stephen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Andrew's going to say, I've I never do. seen him make a mistake once and I've known him for 20 years. That's what Andrew's going to say. No, no, I'm actually going to say something very different. Um, Steve and I have been running our other business invent right coaching mentoring inventors for the last 20 years to license and, and over that 20 years, he's been fantastic about talking about not just what's went right for him as an inventor, but the mistakes he's made. Because you learn a tremendous amount from um, somebody else's mistakes. He's been through it. And, and I just want to thank him for coming on tonight and sharing some mistakes. He kind of is teasing me. He's like, there's one in there, Andrew, you haven't heard. I'm like, okay, it's going to keep it interesting for me because I've heard it all over 20 years. But um, so it's going to be fun. Some of you may know Stephen, some of you may not. But e either way, I think these stories are going to be very informative and educational. So Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Well, before we get into the presentation, just a little bit of background about Stephen. Oh, no. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is uncomfortable. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Success is created from the mistakes that you make along the way. Over the years, Stephen has made a lot of mistakes. He will be opening up and pulling back the curtain on the most pivotal mistakes he has made and what he has learned from them. So we're gonna get a few good takeaways. So definitely go ahead and get your notepad out and a pencil or pen and, and get ready. Um, Stephen has achieved repeat success as an independent inventor. This is just a little bit of background on Stephen for those of you who don't know him. 
uh, including defending his intellectual property against one of the largest toy companies in federal court, developed an innovative packaging solution that has brought to market uh, and is protected by more than 20 patents and has received 15 industry awards and also writes for Forbes, Inc. and Entrepreneur. With much success in his career, the pitfalls were not sparse. In fact, it was a major part of his success. Mistakes move people forward. What do you do when you make a mistake? How do you move forward? We have a little presentation for you and we can't wait to get started. So uh, real quickly, if you guys have any Q&A, uh, we do get a lot of questions towards the end. So if you guys have questions uh, earlier, please go ahead and type them into the questions box, into the chat box, uh, and we'll pick a question and unmute you and you can go ahead and ask that question. Just once again, a reminder, please do not disclose anything that is confidential and is not already publicly available. All right, Stephen, you have the floor. You can go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you very much, Courtney, for that introduction. And um, I gave, I think I gave you and Andrew a list of topics I could possibly talk about. And of course, Andrew went right away to the mistakes I've made. And I was wondering why you, he was so happy about to hear about those. Um, but I've made plenty of mistakes. And at the time, they were upsetting kind of, and, but now they're kind of funny to look back. And I think giving um, a little bit of time, those mis mistakes were really great learning tools for me and maybe for you too. Uh, I don't think you have to make every mistake yourself. I think you can learn from others. So let me share a few of my big ones with you. Um, What's the first slide? Because I don't know what well, order and what, they- Stephen, what are they, what are they going to save? I mean, they're going to save time and money. Those are two important things by learning from a few mistakes well, from you rather than making them themselves. Well, not only time and money, but lost opportunity. Right? Yeah. Because I made some mistakes that I should have probably gone after. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I hesitated. And looking back now, I would, I would never have hesitated. But that just gives, uh, you know, it takes time to, to realize some of those things that are happening to us. Um, we have a couple, we have a fork in the road. We can either go to the right or to the left. And sometimes I went to the wrong direction. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk about those. But what's the first slide? What's the big, what's well, the Before I start one? the first slide, I want to welcome everybody from all over the U.S. And it looks like we have uh, somebody from South Africa, Philippines, mm -hmm. Australia, Quebec, all over the place. So I just want to welcome everybody. And I'm going to go ahead and throw up the slide and let Stephen do his thing. There we go. Are these truly the biggest mistakes you've made, Stephen? The biggest ones? Or are they just... Well, that's, that, maybe that's for another presentation, but these are the, <laughs> the, the big ones that are looking back. Truly yeah, biggest they, mistakes. They're pretty major. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, spin formation, ro my rotating label. Um, this was what, this was my big idea and it finally came across my desk and I went for it. I, I, I applied for all these patents. I figured out the technology. We had licensed it some, to a few of the major players, not only here in the United States, but also around the world. Nescafe coffee was in Japan. Uh, the rotating label was everywhere. And I didn't, um, I didn't do enough, right? I worked so hard to get the licensing deal. I worked so hard to work on production. Um, but once it happened and the royalties were coming in and they were big checks coming in, so big, you know, I took six months off. I just took my kids out of school and told my wife, I never want to see a bill. And we pretty much did whatever we wanted to do. And it was a fantastic trip. There's no regrets on that at all. But looking back, I probably should have put my pedal to the metal. That was not the time to relax. Now, it has really nothing to do with the trip, but maybe that kind of got me thinking about it. I licensed 
that technology to a market leader, CCL label. In fact, they're the largest in the world. And we were selling a lot of product, but why did I pull back? Why did I relax? I shouldn't have. Um, I should have got more involved, right? I should have gone out and, and stayed involved with the customers. I should have asked questions. I should have probably helped with the marketing a little bit, the trade shows, maybe even got more involved in the production of the product. And I didn't feel comfortable with that aspect of it. It could have been bigger, but because of my hesitation, because of I didn't realize that some of these big ideas come around once or twice if you're lucky, that's not the time to relax. That's the time to really focus, ask good questions, surround yourself with, with maybe some other um, mentors to help me to take it to the another level. So looking back, I think it did okay. Um, it should have probably have done 10 times the size, at least that. So when you get that opportunity, so here's my lesson I wanna share with everybody. When you get that opportunity with your idea that you licensed, don't stop. Help your licensee sell more product. Bring on some people that maybe have a little bit more experience and ask for their advice. Surround yourself with people that have gone further than you have. And, and don't think twice about it. Educate, keep on educating yourself because I think everybody knows I'm a big, big believer in education. And for some reason, either I didn't know who to reach out to or I thought they would just take care of itself. But I should have at that point tried harder. And the reason why this means a lot to me now, I, I just listened to another speaker we had on, Rob Angel with Pictionary. And he stayed involved. That was a lesson I learned from his presentation that I did not do. He stayed involved. He, he was a tough negotiator. He, he, he did not stop, right? So the lesson there, once you license an idea, don't stop, help, 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 and help, and learn as much as you can. Ask those questions, surround yourself with really smart people, and, and see if you can take it to the moon. That's what I learned with see, this. It's, can, you, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the things you can do to help, such as always being on top of, you know, with that next version of the product so that your company that you license to can stay on top, things like that. Well, you, this was a little bit different. The, the, the income it was producing was in the millions, right? And, and that was a life changer for me too. I mean, the royalty checks were huge. Um, I didn't think it was gonna end. Everything ends. But if you stay involved, there's line extensions, there's other opportunities. I should have gotten involved in selling equipment. There's all this stuff I could have done, but I, I, I wasn't, um, it was not familiar with me. I wasn't comfortable. And I should have found some people to make me more comfortable with it, right? I needed people that had done it before to say, look, Steve, let me show you how to do this, right? And so sometimes we're hesitant. So for this particular project, and this could be for any project you have, some things you, you're, you're out of your comfort zone. And the only way to get comfortable in that situation is find some people that have been in that situation that can help you through that uncertain, you know, that, that anxiety of, hey, I've never done this before. So it's not just one thing, Andrew. It was just a, a lot of things. Um, your licensee today, more than ever, needs for you to stay involved, to tell your story, to help sell product. And today, it's much different than when I was working on this, because now we have a lot of different social media channels, right? I mean, you have Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram, and you could be a, a cheerleader for your product and have other people around helping you uh, sell more product by talking about it, by building a community on LinkedIn. And that's what we're trying to do with some of the other projects over at um, InventRight. Stephen, before um, we move forward, we've got a couple of questions in relation to what this product is. Can you just briefly explain what Spinlabel is? 
Yeah, it, it, it's actually very simple, but um, it wasn't that simple. And, I, and I, I can do a demo. To show, how about a demo? I show everybody. Go for I'll it. I'll do that. Yeah, All if right. you do a demo, though, we should get out of uh, share mode, and then you should – can you highlight him so he's big, um, uh, Courtney? Yes, um, I just did that. Okay. Label, this is water. And um, click, click on speaker view if he's not big for you guys, the upper right hand corner. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if you look over here, you'll see all the different things that would spin. This is called a spin label, spin label technology. And labels basically don't have enough information. So what I did was that I put a top label over a bottom label. Two labels, not one, two. And the top label has a little window. So I could spin it. And it would give me more information. Okay. So it was a, technically it's an expanded content label that would deliver more information for drug facts, for promotions, for recipes. I remember going down to Walmart and I looked at all the containers and thought, holy cow, look at all those containers that could use more label space. It was mind boggling. We ended up selling hundreds of millions of labels. That sounds like a lot, but compared to how large the industry, I barely scratched the surface. So yeah, I should have, I should have kept on. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. All right. All right, let's go to another big mistake. Next slide. Uh, it looks like we might have lost Andrew, uh, but that's okay. Uh, hang on one second and I'll bring up your presentation. All right. I know his uh, Wi-Fi wasn't fantastic, so give me one second. Well, the next one we're talking about is with Taylor Swift. Yes. You go ahead and start talking about it while I bring it up. Yes, I'll, um, I'll start this. I was, um, I took a little detour from licensing and I started making, designing guitar picks. Why guitar picks? I don't know. Um, a good friend of mine um, came to my office one day and said, hey, let's design guitar picks. He played guitar. He had a couple of music stores. And I was like, why would we bother with this? But anyway, to make a long story short, I started designing guitar picks in all different shapes and sizes with different materials. And we were probably the largest manufacturer of guitar picks in the world just by changing the shape of guitar picks. And one day my office got a call and said, um, I, I came back from lunch and my office manager was really excited. And he said, uh, Steve, guess who called? I said, well, who? And he, and he said, Scott Swift. And I thought, and I said, well, who's Scott Swift? And he said, Taylor Swift's dad. <laughs> And I said, well, who's Taylor Swift? Um, she, was she was 19 years old and she was just hitting the charts and, and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I got to know her dad very well. In fact, he used to call me once a week and I don't know why, but he did. And he saw our guitar picks at a Tennessee Nash, a Nashville gas station. He was a stockbroker. And before he went to work, he'd always stop there to get a donut. And we were selling our guitar picks all around the world. And we sold them uh, actually at 7-Eleven and Walmart, but they were in a lot of gas stations, if you can believe that. And we had a little display and I'll show you the displays in just a minute. And sure enough, um, he saw this guitar pick, which we took the material of a lenticular lens in which James Sheehan kind of, that was his idea. 
and we stamped out guitar picks. And by using a lenticular lens, we could put 13 frames of movement. And so Scott Swift wanted, and we had the Disney lenticular lens at the gas station of some of the movies, 13 frames of a movie you could turn back and forth. And he loved it. And he thought, well, why don't we have guitar picks with Taylor, Taylor strumming the guitar or singing or dancing? He loved it. So um, I got to know Scott very well. And I also got to know Taylor very well and her whole family, which was a little surprising um, that she was so open and so smart at 19 years old. She was remarkable. And she had just landed the contract for Walmart. So her, her star was, I mean, she was going to the moon and she was extremely popular. And, and, um, and I, thought, I thought it could help. So I got on the phone with her and her family and Big Machine Records, Scott, I, you see him sometimes in some of the TV shows. He's Buschetta, I think it's Scott Buschetta. And um, I said, I could probably help with, with your licensing because it looks like you're gonna be licensed. If you're licensing at Walmart, you're gonna be licensing everywhere. And, and I kind of thought maybe I could help. And so I got on the call and we were all talking about it. Now here's the big mistake. Um, I talked to Scott and the, the group and the family how I could help with the licensing. And they weren't real familiar with that, although records you license, collect royalties with records, of course. But I could tell the record company didn't really want me involved, but the family did. And I should have picked up on that clue a little bit better. So we had a conversation and after I hung up, I said, you know, I'm just going to go out and go out and meet the family and spend a, spend a couple of days and get to know them a little bit better and talk about licensing and what I could do for them. But I didn't go. I didn't go. Um, looking back, I should have just got on the plane. I should have just showed up at the door, say, I'm here. I need 10 minutes of your time, 10 minutes of your time, knowing them that I would have stayed the weekend. They are that, that family was so open, so inclusive. It was remarkable because when I met Taylor and her, her mom, the time she played at Arco Arena, uh, we had tickets. They invited us to her, um, her trailer. We spent an hour and they, she was as, is nice and is open and is a friend. She just wanted to sell merchandise and she wanted to know this and that. And, and she showed me her bedroom, her bathroom, and there was nothing she was not willing to share. She was just wonderful. I should have got on the plane. Now, why didn't I get on that plane? I don't know. What would life look like today if I got on that plane? Would I have represented Taylor Swift and all her licensing deals? Maybe. Because I was very comfortable with that. I knew that business and I knew I knew that business well enough to guide them. So I look back and that was probably, I hesitated. So let's go to, let's go back to the, so everybody can, I can see everybody. Um, I, I can see you. Courtney real big. I can't see everybody else though. Maybe I need to go to a different screen. Go to gallery view. Okay. Um, so everybody, um, I hesitated. Why? Was it confidence? I don't know. I thought I had a lot of confidence. Did I read the situation right? I did. You know, that her company wanted me, didn't want me getting close to it. They wanted to control it. Um, did they understand licensing? No, they didn't. It was fairly new to them. And um, I had a, a good, I had, my relationship was so solid with their father and with their mother and with Taylor, I should have just gone and met them and say, look, I could at least spend a couple days, spend a couple hours, whatever I can do to help. But that could have been a life changer for my company and for me personally, I didn't take it. So I guess, what's the lesson? Just do it. 
Don't overthink it. Take it. You know who else wrote about this recently? Barbara on Shark Tank wrote about this. Did anybody see that letter? When she was interviewing to be a shark and she got the notice from Burnett that they picked somebody else. And she just wrote back and got on a plane and showed up and said, no, I'm the right guy. I'm the right woman for it. And she got it. That's what got me reflecting on this too. I should have done the same thing. Lesson learned. So if something happens, if you see an opportunity, take it. Because you can always look back and go, oh, I didn't get it. But you did everything in your power to make it happen. Don't ever look back and go, I should have, could have, would have. Don't do it. Just do it. Trust your instincts. I should have. All right. Let's, let's go to another big mistake. I don't think Andrew's ever heard this one. Is he, is he even on? He's probably getting on right now. I'm really glad he didn't get to hear the story so I could actually repeat this again to him some other time. And please, no one tell him this. We'll keep the secret from him. I think this is great that he's not on. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay. Hang on. God, these are painful stories. God, I got to relive these. Oh, here's my favorite one. Whoo! This took me a long time to figure this out. Um, as you know, the rotating label, we were selling millions, hundreds of millions. We won all these awards. It was everywhere. And um, I, I got, we had licensed it, sub-licensed it to two companies, one in Japan and one in Northern Ireland. And the one from Northern Ireland, the company was called Kindleworth. I got a notice from Kindleworth that, hey, Lego would like to use your spin label on a new product called Bionicles. And I was pretty excited about that. I mean, who wouldn't be? It's like, got a toy? I mean, I could see it on spices. I could see it maybe on some other applications, but on the toy, how'd they find me? Fantastic, I'm in. So I, they signed an NDA and they sent over the artwork and my office built the first samples of a rotating label on Bionicles. And uh, that was about the time where I said, I'm gonna take off for a while and just walked out of the office. <laughs> it was like, I'm gone, I'm gonna go have a good time for six months. So I, that's what I did. And um, I didn't think twice about it. Didn't really follow up on it, didn't really care about it. And sure enough, Coming back six months, I, I get back and, and sure enough, my son loves Legos and there's a, a, he was having a party and someone, he opened a present and there was Legos and he turned the label and it was spinning. I was um, pretty shocked. You can go to the gallery again. I don't need to look at it too much here. So, um, <laughs> We had, um, I was, I was, I was like, I think every inventor, I felt violated. I felt, how could this good, good company, toy company do this to me? I had patents. They signed an NDA. I made samples. I had a paper trail. I had everything and they did this to me. So I looked at it very carefully, sent it over to my attorneys. Uh, long story short, I figured out how they manufactured it and I took them to federal court. Okay. And that's a really long process and I would not wish that on anybody. Um, but I do know it's probably one of the best experience I could have possibly had being an inventor. I didn't feel that way at the time. I feel that way now. So, uh, I mean, you know, Stephen key, you know, design versus Lego in federal court, was a little daunting, the whole thing was. Um, but sure enough, I got through it. We settled two weeks before I went to trial. And <clears throat> I went on my business. They stopped producing it. And um, I didn't think too much about it after that. Until later, thinking about the whole process, much, much later, I realized 
maybe that wasn't the correct thing to do. Now, I felt at the time that if I didn't defend my patents in federal court, how would anybody else pay me? That's what I was thinking. That I would say, you know, hey, if they're not, if they're not, if you're, if they're not paying royalties, why am I paying your royalties? That's what I thought. Um, but looking closer to it, there's something that I just didn't grasp. Because three years and a lot of time, a lot of pain is a lot to go through. But looking back, I wouldn't probably have sued them today. Because they didn't hurt my business. See, they didn't damage my business at all because the technology that they used was really, really slow. Awful. No other company on the planet would have done it the way they were doing it. And I hadn't thought about it that way. You see, the rotating label, the difficulty with selling even more rotating labels was that the machine was expensive and it had to run really fast. Because if you're going to put it on a Coke or a Pepsi or, or whatever, it had to run so fast. This machine was so slow, no company on the planet would have wanted it. <laughs> Holy smokes, why didn't I think about that at the time? I got too emotional with it. Okay. And, and um, could I have avoided that? Yeah, would I? I wouldn't have had the experience to talk about it. I know that I know the experience is worth a lot to me now. Because I learned a lot about patents, I learned a lot about how to file intellectual property that has value. I learned a lot about workarounds and variations. I learned that the game that's being played. And without that experience, I wouldn't be able to talk about it. So there's a lot of value now. But knowing what I know now, I would not have done it because it really wasn't hurting me. Because it all comes down to speed and manufacturing and cost and all the things that they really have to do with business, not patents. There's the difference. And that's why I'm talking a lot about intellectual property that has value in the marketplace, not trying to protect it in court. So that was um, a pretty painful experience. <laughs> Woo! Won't do that again, hopefully, anytime soon. All right, let's go to another pain. Do I have another pain in there? I think I'm done with them. Am I done? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, jeez. Okay. What else do we have lined up for me? Uh, I just rejoined Stephen, and the second I'm rejoining, you're saying I didn't hear what you said, and you're like, "Don't tell him. Don't don't nobody tell him what I said." I'm like, <laughs> "Okie dokie." <laughs> <laughs> well, Andrew, uh, you, you'll have to hear it later. And, and, all right. All right. There go. So, what's the? Oh yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, the, what'd, you, what'd you mess up here, Stephen? Well, what'd you do wrong here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> we, we did every design in the world with guitar picks. And you can go back to gallery again. I, I don't need to look at that too. I look at that every day, by the way. And hey, just so you know, um, oh God, there's another mess. You know, now that I'm going through it, I, I've, I've got more. But I won't bore you guys with all of them. But um, the thing about this guitar pick that was so fascinating to me that it, I was able to do something else. I was out of my comfort zone. I knew nothing about the uh, uh, music business, but it was so much fun. I, I never had this much fun. Um, we, I met amazing people. We were selling product all over the world. Uh, it was one of those great experiences that just happened. I mean, it was by accident that this one little skull guitar pick changed the world very quickly for me because, you know, we, when I went to a, a trade show at NAMM, the biggest music show in the United States, I, I won best of show with a piece of plastic. How do you do that with a piece of plastic? Um, and we did that two years in a row. And it taught me a lot about myself. It gave me confidence that I could do other things was probably the best experience. Um, the parts I didn't like about it, and this is the lesson here, and this is the mistake I made. 
I had all these employees. I went from no employees to 30 employees with the warehouse, shipping to Walmart, shipping to every, all these stores, and I wasn't prepared for it. It happened that fast. And once again, I didn't have anybody to mentor me on that transition. I had a, my best friend, I remember, came over and he was really comfortable because the numbers were just getting bigger. Okay, I was floating hundreds of thousands of dollars. And my best friend came to me and, and he's a pretty successful guy. And he goes, ah, nothing. Because he was playing a much bigger game of floating millions. So I should have just taken a deep breath and go, I need help. I need someone that has more experience than I do to help me through my anxiety, uncertainty. And I didn't do that, right? I just tried to push through and I sold the company because of it. A company that was doing pretty darn well, okay? And it was that hard. I didn't realize how easy it really was because it just sold itself. It, it was easy to market, it was easy to sell, orders came in every single day. It was a winner, I sold a winner. <laughs> I didn't know it was a winner. I just let it go, I did, because the, the anxiety of it was too much for me. And what what were not, you used to before that, Stephen? What was your- well, I was licensing where I didn't have to do any of that stress. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to float my own money. I didn't have to do any of that. Life was really pretty easy. This, this actually took a lot of work. Here's the other thing too. I had to really work. I mean, like around the clock. Andrew probably, I don't know if he remembers it, but I lost a lot of weight and I was probably a pretty, pretty much a nervous wreck half the time. It didn't fit my personality, but did I give it a chance? I think this all comes back to, and I'm glad we're talking about this tonight, of finding people that can help you go to your next level, whatever that is. And for all of us, it's going to be different things. But I'm all about, I learned, I've learned through all these experiences now, sometimes you need to find a team member or bring someone else on or find someone that's done it that has done it more than you have and, and have a mentor, right? Or have a coach, which we do at Invent Right, or have someone there to take you through those, those areas of unknown. I didn't have to sell the business. I did. And my wife complains about it all the time. Why did you sell that business? Because that was a blast. Everybody had a blast. Um, so yeah, I made a mistake there too. If I would, some, some day, sometimes I dream about if it was mine now, what I would do. And I get kind of excited about the designs and meeting the people and doing some really great, cool stuff. I think about it now. And I just let it go out the door. So what time is it? Are we, are we, at, the, are we at the painful time where yeah, why don't we open the questions, you guys. That, and, and now that I'm thinking about it, I've got a couple more, but we'll save that for another time. So those are some of my big mistakes that I've made. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. I know we, we've got a, a lot more to cover, so we'll, we'll continue that on another Yeah, we could, we could probably do an all day or with these, comp with these problems or mistakes. <laughs> Absolutely. So in relation to questions, uh, we've got a lot of great questions and a lot of off topic questions. So we're going to keep to the, the topic of the mistakes and uh, I'm going to start asking some questions. We did get a VIP question from someone before uh, the Inventors Online started. So this question was from Jean Marie and her question is, I'd like to ask Stephen if he ever had a situation that he originally viewed as a mistake, but generally something he could have done better but it ended up working out for the best. And this question is in relation to a product um, not being licensed during COVID and that maybe it was for the better for Gene. Yeah, I, I think um, if something doesn't happen, maybe you don't get a deal today. I, I, don't, I don't look at that as a problem. I look at it as it's just, it's just not the right time. So I think timing 
is is really um, interesting. In fact, tomorrow night, I'm going to talk about a big project that I'm working on. I mean, a big one. Probably the biggest project I've ever been involved in. It's so big that there's no way we could we can cover it all. In fact, all the major players are doing it now. We're working with all the major companies. It's that big. Um, but four years ago, you're going to hear tomorrow night, four years ago, not one person was interested in it. <laughs> How do you go from no one caring to getting calls from every major company around the world's calling? Timing, right? So, so to answer that question, sometimes if it's not the right timing, don't worry about it. Put it back on the shelf a little bit. It's okay. Maybe you bring it out at a different time. That's perfectly fine. It's just timing. So don't worry about it. Some things, if, there, if it's not meant to happen, don't fight it. Go with it. Go with the flow. Don't keep on trying to push that rock up the hill till you're so tired that you don't like pushing any longer. Don't do that to yourself. Yeah. Great. Thank you. We've got a lot of questions on uh, your spin label. David, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and then I'm going to spotlight you and ask your question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Courtney. So Stephen, you, you mentioned on your book and uh, many other times that uh, you had a setback with your label because you presented like the idea like, hey, I have this idea for a label that spins. And there was nothing to license there. So you went on to license the method of manufacturing uh, later on. But how did you determine I mean, you didn't know at the time. It's like, okay, how are these things going to be manufactured? So, so how did you end up learning what you had to learn in order to be able to license that and be so successful with it? Yeah, that, um, <clears throat> that was by accident. Um, I had thought I, I thought I invented the rotating label because I did a patent search. And um, what happened was that um, we had a professional patent searching firm back in Washington, D.C. do it for us. And it came back. My attorneys were really funny because they, they know me. When I first showed them a rotating label, they laughed and goes, there's no way you invented this because we know you do goofy stuff. This is what they kind of told me. So they kind of laughed. And I said, yeah, I kind of do goofy stuff. But so they did a patent search and they came back and they, they said, Steve, you're the inventor. We couldn't find anything. So I filed two patents on it. And um, next thing you know, I'm in a meeting with Procter and Gamble. I got invited by the CEO and president at the time, Dirk Yeager. And um, their technical group was a little mad that I guess the CEO was bringing me in and that was their job. So they, they, they did a lot of, they did more searching, okay? And they did find this, they found it. Um, they did a better job. And, and, you know, sure enough, they, in that meeting, they said, you know, Mr. Key, we're not gonna pay you one penny. And they slid this piece of paper across the table and they all walked out. And, and then sure enough, on that piece of paper were all these prior arts. And sure enough, there was my rotating label. I mean, not just, a little bit like it, exactly like it. I mean, that was the idea. It had been invented. I did not invent that. I thought I did, but I did not. And so I was devastated, right? But I couldn't, it, here's, here's the catch, and, I, and I'm trying to explain this to a lot of people. What bothered me was I got interest from the president of Procter & Gamble. Wow. Number two, why wasn't this on the market? So who cares about the patents? The problem is why wasn't this commercialized? That's what I realized that's even more important than sometimes a patent. Well said. So I couldn't believe it. Um, but every, all their attorneys, everybody told me, my attorneys, everybody said, forget about it. Well, I'm pretty, I'm pretty stubborn guy. And I couldn't believe there had to be a problem. And if I now you have to be a detective, man. I read the patent over and over again. And one thing that jumped out at me, but didn't jump out at anybody else. They didn't know how to make it. There is that one 
clue uh, how to make this label. So when that dawned on me, I thought, well, there's my angle. I'm going to figure out how to make it. And then I'm going to patent how to make it. And that's what I did. And just so you know, you know, those are all patents on the label right there. That's a half a million dollars on one idea. <laughs> okay. So because it was producing so much revenue, I wanted to block everybody else. And that's, those are blocking patents, by the way. So I learned a lot about intellectual property. And the one thing I learned with Lego and with this project, I learned a lot about IP. That's why I really love patents. And um, I'm fascinated by the details and what could get patented and what's not going to patent them. I'm fascinated, fascinated by commercializing intellectual property that really lines up with your business objectives. Because sometimes they don't. You know, most patents don't even have anything to do with your business objectives. They're filed out of fear, whatever they are. So I'm really concerned about filing good intellectual property. I'm a big believer in the USPTO. I'm a big believer in patents, although I don't think you need to use them the way people think you need to use them, but there's other ways to use them. They have huge value. Intellectual property is what's made this country great when it comes to innovation. So get back to your question, yes. There is no method of manufacturing. I figured it out just because I'm stubborn and I didn't want anybody to tell me no. There you go. I hate Wonderful. hearing the word no. Yeah, I love it. That's fantastic. Thank you, David. And, and thank you, Stephen. Uh, Runo, we have uh, your question here. If you'd like to go ahead and ask that, I'll go ahead and unmute you. You're going to have to click. There you go. Uh, Actually, I asked two questions. <laughs> one, first one was, so um, it's more of an issue in, in uh, having a company, not so much in licensing, licensing but, but how do you find the right person to help you, guide you through? Uh, every once in a while, somebody tells me, oh, you need to get an advisory board. And I say, oh, well, that's okay, but really good advisors. I don't happen to have friends with that particular expertise. Right. Really good advisors, they ask for $100,000 just to be on the board, <laughs> something, something crazy. So I gave up right there and never came back to it. That was question number one. And no, that was question number two. And number one was whatever happened to the label because Maybe I'm not looking hard enough, but I don't see one when I go into, let's okay. say, a drugstore. So those two questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Reno. I really um, appreciate the whole, the whole experience. This is wonderful. Very okay. helpful. Um, Thank you. I'm not quite sure where the rotating label is. I know um, Yellowstone National Park was using it for a while. I know some of the colleges in Montana use it. I don't know if anybody else does that. The patent portfolio was purchased from me. They purchased everything. I was able to collect royalties for basically 20 years. And um, I licensed it multiple times to multiple companies. And eventually the company came and bought the whole patent portfolio. So every time I tried to get away from it, it came back. Um, there's a fascination with it, but it was one of those issues with packaging that that I'm very well aware of now. It was a cost issue, education issue. Those are, those are two things. So uh, I learned a lot through that. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, advisors, that's a really tough question. I don't have the perfect answer for that um, because I- You did have a mentor. I, I have a mentor. That's a very good friend of mine. And, and he's been a good friend of mine since my early 20s. And so he's 83 and he's still in the game of licensing, by the way. And he's, he, he, he's, a, he's 83 going on 18. I've never seen anybody with more energy than this guy. Um, I think you find like-minded individuals that are, that are fascinated with it. That has nothing to do with money. It has to do with the excitement of it. And I'll give you an example. Um, there's a gentleman, Richard Levy, um, that did the Furby, and he is in the Hall of Fame, the Toy Hall of Fame, I believe, and he's written eight books, 
and uh, he's the most amazing guy. If you can get to him, he'll help you. He's a mentor. He, he's in his blood. This business has been so good to him that he's a sharing guy. He's a, and now he's a rare bird. I have to admit, he's probably pretty rare. I think if you find these old guys like me that have been through the war zones, they're willing to help the younger guy not maybe go through a few of the landmines. That's the one thing I would recommend. Um, because there's a lot of knowledge from some of the senior guys out here that have been through the war. Uh, and maybe some of the older guys don't get asked those questions any longer. But I think, I think they have huge value in our society. Let me tell you what's so amazing about tonight that we're having. I get to talk about this and I'm 64 years old and I cannot thank you enough for letting me share it. That's how I feel about it. And I think you're gonna find other people like me that feel the same way about it. So you have to find those people. I don't know where you find them, but don't be afraid to ask and don't be afraid to reach out to somebody. And, and maybe, maybe they're not in the game any longer, but they've been in the game. And they're going to treat you differently if they've been in the game. All right. The, the guys that, that have gone up and gone down and gone up and gone down, they're more willing to help you up. The guys that are just going up like this, they're not going to pay attention to you. And that's unfortunate because a lot of them have forgotten where they, where they came from. <laughs> It's the old guys that, that have gotten beat up that realize the next guy needs a hand too. So reach out to some of the older guys that have maybe a little bit more time to talk about it, share with it, and find those guys. They're out there, but you got to dig, but you have to ask. If you don't ask, it won't happen. The one thing I've learned about life, you have to knock on the doors for opportunity to open. If you don't knock on the doors, they will never open. Well said, Stephen. Thank you very much, Reno. Good questions. We have Christopher, um, Christopher Fitzhardy. Uh, you've got a question about multiple offers. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question. Oh, we have multiple offers. I like that. You guys hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. So first and foremost, thanks so much for all that you guys do. Really appreciate it. Um, we actually spoke on the phone a few weeks ago, Stephen, about DRTV. So I want to Thank you again for being so generous with your time. Um, as for my question, uh, yeah, I was just curious if you ever were in the position where you had multiple offers or perhaps one of your students received multiple offers and um, how it went and if you learned anything from the result, if any regrets perhaps or lessons you could uh, give us? Um, if, thank you for that question, by the way, because it's a really good one. Um, Multiple offers are pretty amazing, but this is not Hollywood, okay? So um, you see it in the movies where there's multiple offers and you know, everybody's fighting for the, getting the, you know, the, the property or the deal or the actor or the, the script or the, whatever it is. That plays out a little differently than reality, I think. Um, multiple offers um, is a great, great thing, but there's someone that's listening tonight and that knows quite well, it's very nerve wracking is what it is. Um, because it's exciting at the same time, but someone's going to be upset. Right. And that's what bothers me because if someone's upset, um, maybe you burn a bridge, maybe they compete with you, maybe they work around you. There's all these things they could do. So although it sounds fantastic, it's it's nerve wracking because you, you really want to get through it with your reputation intact, right? I think every deal that you do, you always want to be able to go back to those companies and cut another deal, right? So how do you do that? Um, if you're licensing an idea and, you, and you're licensed to multiple companies, you really want and there's a lot of interest, it's okay to say there's a tremendous amount of interest here. That's, that's between the lines, someone else wants it, okay, maybe. You, you, you never wanna leverage one company against the X, another one. No one likes to kiss and tell or leverage, they don't like that. They don't like to be used. If you leverage 
this against me, I right away I know you probably don't have my best interest. And so that I think that that's not great for the relationship going forward. So how do you do it? You have good communication between both and make sure someone's not going down so far down this road that when you tell them no, they're going to be mad. If I've got a company that's building prototypes, doing sales samples, showing to buyers, and then I pull it from them, that's a bad thing. Because now you've embarrassed this person in front of the, his boss, the company, the buyers. Ugh, ugh. So I just think that you be as open and as upfront as you can, when you can. And just say, look, thank you for your interest. This is really exciting. And I really want to work with you. But by the way, this product, and I'm, I'm really using, there's someone here that, that happened to, and Michelle, raise your hand for just a minute, because I know it happened to you. Um, and she was so kind. I even wrote about it. She, she just explained the situation of the interest level that between the lines, kind of, and they kind of understood what was happening a little bit, right? So don't go too far down the road where someone's going to get mad. And, and don't tell them who you're competing with. Don't do that either. If they ask, say it's, you're under NDA, but just say, look, we, we really, if you're really interested, let's get down to it, right? Because I want to work with you, but th there's some other interest here. That's the way I would play that. Um, has it happened to me multiple offers? Not enough, <laughs> all right? So I haven't been that fortunate to have that situation come down the road, but it's happened to a few of our students. And uh, it's, it's nerve wracking especially if you're dealing with some major players. Yeah. Great. Good question. Thank you. I know we're out of time here, but uh, one last quick question here by Michael Greer. His uh, video, it looks like is, is not um, available. I'm going to see if, if Michael, you're able to unmute your mic. Otherwise I'll go ahead and ask your question about licensees being at odds. Looks like it's not going to happen. That's okay. All right, Michael. Uh, your question to Stephen was, have you ever made a mistake that put your licensees at odds? That did what? That, have you ever made a mistake that put your licensees at odds? Hmm. Uh, yes. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. <laughs> yes, I have. Um, I had licensed the rotating label to the biggest label, label company in the world, CCL Label, and they had never done licensing before. And so they licensed one technology and it was the most expensive technology. And so it was out there, they were selling it. And now, now they've got cores interested in this label. And at the same time, I'm, I'm talking to Coca-Cola and they, they, they want a label that's lower cost, higher speed. And I develop technology, file a patent, and I go to CCL label and say, do you want this technology? It's going to cost you this much. And they said, no, we don't want it. So I said, okay. So then I sent it over to Coors. <laughs> and so now Coors sees it and goes, well, this is better technology. It's lower cost, fast speed. We want this new technology. And they tell CCL label, we're not interested anymore. CCL label calls me and goes, we got a deal on the table and you yanked it from us. I go, well, you didn't want it. So they said, all right, we'll take that technology too. They ended up doing that four times. Um, and each time I, I negotiated minimum guarantees of a quarter of a million dollars. At the end of the day, it was actually three times. It was $750,000 a year. They had to pay me minimum guarantees because I kept on innovating. Oh. And 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 compete and asked them if they want it. When they told it no, I went back to the same clients they were pitching it to, so they had to buy it again and again and again. So yeah, they they're not too happy with me even today. Um, in fact, one of the people that on CCL label was on LinkedIn, and I and congratulated him on this great technology. And he goes, "Wow, thank you very much." And I said, "CCL label is the best company I've ever worked with." They're like, "Wow, this is really nice. Who are you?" I go, I don't think they feel the same way about me. I gave him my name. He never replied back ever again. <laughs> so, um, yeah. That's great. Well, thank you for your story, Stephen. That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, while we, uh, Stephen, if you have any final remarks, everyone can go ahead and type in your thank yous to 
uh, Stephen, uh, he pulled back the curtain a little bit for you guys today. Um, Stephen, while they do that, and I'll go ahead and, and get some group shots in a second. But before we do that, did you have any final remarks for our audience? No, I just want to thank everybody. We had a full house tonight. Uh, thank you very much. It's always nice. I remember when I used to do a, a little bit of speaking early on and maybe five people showed up. I was still excited about it, even though there's only five. But thank you for showing up tonight. And thank you for being part of the community. It's very, very important that all of us stick together, we work together, because your success is everybody's success. And I truly believe that, because if you're successful, you're opening the door for the next inventor. You're, the, you're an ambassador to this, this world of innovation. So treat those licensees and treat everybody out there with a lot of respect so the door is open for the next guy, the next guy and the next guy. So I'm glad to be part of it and I'm gonna keep talking about it and, and hopefully um, do a little bit more writing. We, we have a book coming out soon and uh, keep on um, helping the community because this industry has been remarkable and I'm, I'm proud to be part of it. And I'm proud that you guys are here tonight too. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Stephen. Uh, everyone wanna put your hands up for our group photo? I love it. Hey, uh, I, I, am I all the ones? Come on, I, I, there's a couple people that aren't happy here. Come on, get a picture there. All, all right. right, we got the first one. Oh God, this is a full house. Hang on one second. You all right, we got it. We're going to the second page. Hey, how do you get on the first page and not the second page? How does that work? You gotta get here in time, you gotta be early. All right, ready? And one, two, three, second page. All right. There's all right, four pages. Okay. Is there four pages? We're not going to do it all four, are we? I think we're going to go up to three pages here. All right. Uh, hang on a second. One more. Got a big crowd. Yep, one last page, third page. All right, put your hands up. <laughs> hang on. All right. Thank you, everybody. And uh, keep inventing, as Andrew always says, and uh, get out there, fight the good fight, make your own stories. And that's how you do it, by getting out there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephen. We really appreciate you taking the time and talking to us as a group. Uh, thank you again. We hope to see you all in our next meeting so we can bring you more expert oh, information. Oh, we have some really interesting news, you guys. Maybe we'll tell you later, but you won't believe who's coming back on it's going to be great. I, I, I should, I don't know if I should say it or not, because they might back out. If they back out, it's not great, right? I mean, I'm kind of spoiling it if they back out. Up to you. Okay, let me tell you what's going to happen. Um, the USPTO came on, and they gave a presentation. They're coming back, but they're going to bring the judges that do PTAB. Is anybody familiar with PTAB? It's causing all the problems. Everybody's kind of, well, we're going to get judges to come on and talk about it. How's that? And then, I know, can you believe that? I can't believe it either. And then they're gonna come back again to talk about some of the issues. But the USPTO knows we're on their radar because you guys are showing up. That's how it works. You're showing up, they know you're showing up, and now they wanna help educate a little bit, tell their side of the story. You always wanna get both sides, all the stories, and we're gonna do that at IGA. So thank you for showing up. And uh, it's going to get a, it's going to be an exciting year. So we'll see if we can right. ask those hard questions. Right. That's right. And uh, real quickly before we go, I'm going to post a link in the chat for everyone. And this is for the Michigan Inventors Coalition Summit, which is happening tomorrow, uh, Friday, and uh, Saturday. Uh, I will be there for Thursday and Friday. A quick presentation from IGA. And there's a lot of really great speakers and a lot of free. Uh, resources information that you will get if you join. It's $10 for all three days. Uh, here at IGA, uh, we like to help push the uh, inventor groups across the nation. And this is from Michigan Inventors Coalition. It's actually a pretty big inventors group, a couple of them underneath the branch of Michigan, uh, of the Michigan group. So definitely just check it out. You don't have to uh, attend, just take a look at the link and, and see if there's any speakers there might, that might be of any interest to you. Yeah, good. Thank you for mentioning that good group. Whatever we can do to help support all the groups. Wonderful. Well, go ahead. You guys can feel free to take a look at that. I'll stay for a minute just in case if you guys need to click on that. And beside that, thank you so much for being an awesome audience. We really appreciate it. Thank you again as well, Stephen, for kind of 
pulling back the curtain a little bit on your mistakes. I know there's there's still more to talk about, and I'm so sure so fun to come. talk about your mess ups. I love that. <laughs> thank you very much for that opportunity. Of course, absolutely, Stephen. Well, thank you, everyone. Take care and have a great night. All right. Bye. Good night, everybody. <laughs> good night. <laughs>